Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. MD is a groundbreaking pioneer.
Thomas, he just can advance the slides as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Every talk is different. <laughs> this, this is the radical mastectomy by Halstead, and you can see the extent of the surgery was pretty significant. But as I said, nowadays, today, we have lesser procedures that are much less disfiguring and can be equally effective. Now, the problem was this. In heart disease, my concern was, are we falling into the same rut? For the last 40 years, we've been doing stents, we've been doing bypasses, and we use drugs and pills. None of those things that I've just mentioned have one single solitary thing whatsoever to do with the causation of the illness. Right? The stopgap patch job. Okay. Now that doesn't take anything from my cardiovascular colleagues who I know I respect their care, their compassion, and their fund of knowledge. But we're going to talk about this a little more. Now, suppose you decided that you were going to hang out your shingle <clears throat> in either Okinawa, perhaps central rural, uh, rural China, central Africa, the Papua Highlands in Virginia, or the Tower of Himara in northern Mexico. Forget it. You're going to plan on selling pencils. They don't have cardiovascular disease. Why? They all thrive on whole food plant-based nutrition without oil. This is the oldest slide in my presentation. 1968. The year that I was leaving Vietnam, having spent a year there as a combat surgeon. And it reminds me to share with the audience <coughs> that if we were to autopsy our GIs who died in combat in Korea, Average age, 20. 80% of those young GIs already at autopsy have gross evidence of coronary artery disease. Some, interestingly enough, not enough to have their cardiac events yet. But there at age 20, the disease is established. Now, we took it a step further. In 1999, 45 years later, this time looking at young women and young men between the ages of 17 and 34 who have died of accidents, homicides, and suicides. And what happens? The disease now is ubiquitous. Interesting, ubiquitous. You graduate from high school in this country, you get a diploma, and you also get the foundation for heart disease. Not a good plan, not a good plan. Now, if we take our diet to a third world country like Micronesia, now, now, <clears throat> left to their own devices, in Micronesia, the people were extremely healthy. They were thriving on a fruit and vegetable diet and Really, not a problem. But then somebody discovered, somebody discovered that millions and millions of birds have been de depositing their little phosphate contribution, which filled up to an incredible deposit of phosphate-rich earth in Micronesia. So much so that somebody came in with a backhoe on giant ships, and suddenly, Everybody in Micronesia and Nairo became a millionaire. When you become a millionaire in Nairo, you eat meat five times a day. Now what have done? They're out. Their diabetes is through the roof. Same with heart disease. We do the same thing in Trinidad and Tobago. Hypertension ought to be about 1 to 3 percent in the developing country, 25 percent and 30% in Tanzania. 
Now, one of the most frequent phone calls that I get, when somebody calls and says, Dr. Esselstyn, I want to see you about my heart disease. But really, there's absolutely no reason that I should have heart disease. Okay, why is that? I, all my life, I've gone to the gym five days a week, I work out, I sweat. There's absolutely no reason that I should have heart disease. Well, now, I'll be the first to admit that exercise is a bonus, but nothing trumps food. Nothing trumps food. Here's an example. This is a German, German study. You had to examine these marathon runners who all took a, to, the requirement was they had to have run two to three marathons the preceding year. And they were all, all over 55. When they carefully studied them, 90 of the 100 had cardiovascular disease. Now, in eight years ago, in Los Angeles, when I was moderating a panel, one of my panel members was Lou Keller. And Lou Keller is a professor of public health at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And on that panel that day, Lou Keller made the following statement. All males who are 60 and all females who are 70 who have been exposed to the traditional Western diet have cardiovascular disease and should be treated as such. A few minutes ago, when I said <clears throat> there was a study that showed men and women between the ages of 17 and 34 who had died of accidents, homicides, and suicides, coronary disease was ubiquitous. So increasingly, as I stand here before this absolutely gifted and intelligent audience, I cannot help but say, how many of you are over the age of 17? <laughs> I've always found I could be more effective when I was working with patients. OK, now, here, here is a chance we had to get it right. This is World War II. And in World War II, the Axis powers in Germany overran the low countries of Holland and Belgium. And they occupied Denmark and Norway. And it was characteristic that the Germans would take away their livestock for their troops. So their cattle, their sheep, their goats, their pigs, their chickens, their turkeys, gone. Suddenly, now these Western European nations had become plant-based. And interesting, interesting things began to happen. So they looked, that is Dr. Strom and Janssen, reporting in England's leading medical journal, The Lancet, in 1951, looked at the deaths, the deaths from heart attack and stroke in Norway during this period. So I need you to work with me here, and we're going to look at the deaths from heart attack and stroke in Norway, 1927, going up. 30, going up, 35, going up, 39, in come the Germans, whoop, 40, whoop. <laughs> but look what happened. In 1945, we had the death of Adolf Hitler, and immediately, back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back come the strokes, back come the heart attacks. Absolutely profound, but sadly, we did not get it right. OK. Now, this is kind of an interesting one. 905,000 patient years of follow-up. I was particularly interested in this subset who were age 55, men and women, age 55 with optimal, optimal risk factors. Not smoking, nice level of cholesterol, not high blood pressure, not diabetic, regularly exercised, 
and they followed them for 30 years until they were 85. By 85, remember now, at age 55, none of these people had cardiovascular disease. 30 years later, 30% of the women, 40% of the men now had cardiovascular disease. Sooner or later, later the good old Western diet is going to get you. Okay. All right, now we're going to switch gears and some new, new vocabulary comes out. And perhaps these next four, five, six slides will be the most important that I can share with you today. What you see on the right obviously is a thoroughly diseased artery. You're probably saying, when this finally closes off, it's going to be an heart attack. Well, interestingly enough, no. Maybe 10%. 10% will have a heart attack. Why is that? Because as this has been developing over the years, the downstream heart muscle that this artery supplies has been crying out for more oxygen and nutrient. So much so that it will build these little tiny threads, little threads of collateral blood vessels that will bypass this blockage. So that when this becomes 100% blocked, you still will not have had a heart attack because those little collateral vessels have had enough blood supply in them to sustain the downstream heart muscle viability. Now, yes, this kind of blockage can cause chest pain, angina, shortness of breath, but interestingly, not a heart attack except in 10%. Now, on the other one, on the left, here we get into the key of this whole presentation. There are two words that I'm going to ask you to try to remember in this presentation. Two words. Gosh, I look at this group out there, I know you can handle two words. <laughs> one, this is the endothelium, this little my tiny dark line. This little tiny dark line, all experts in this disease would agree that the endothelium is the, adjic, is the absolute magic uh, of uh, holding the, together the health of our blood vessels. Why? Because it makes an absolutely marvelous molecule of gas. This is the second word. Nitric, not nitrous. Nitric oxide, okay? Nitric oxide and the endothelium. They are linked hand in hand. And it's when the endothelium is functioning properly and makes enough nitric oxide, you are absolutely protected. Now here, I'm gonna switch gears just for a moment. And all, many of you have heard about an angiogram. What an angiogram consists of is when you pass the catheter through the wrist or through the groin up into the, one of the heart arteries, you inject dye, and here you get this lovely picture of the inside, the inside of the artery. We call that the lumen. So you can argue that this is a luminography is what we're looking at, the inside of the artery. But now we're going to do something a little different. Where this yellow arrow is, on the tip of the catheter, we are now going to place an ultrasound probe, and here we are going to shoot an ultrasound picture right here. And here it is in the lower right. And you can see the beautiful, beautiful outline of this artery. And that's the tip of the catheter. Now, now what you've done, is you advance that catheter a few more millimeters. Here we are at the blue arrow, and you shoot another picture. And once again, we see this beautiful outline, lumen, right here. And this is the tip of the catheter. But 
Wait a minute. What's this character here? This crescent plaque. That is an arteriosclerotic plaque. Coronary artery disease. Is that dangerous? Has it even seemed to injure the diameter of the artery? You bet it is. Because, as we'll see in a moment, how 90% of heart attacks occur. Because those young plaques that are blocking the aortic artery by no more than zero up to 50%, when they rupture, then real problems develop, as we'll see. Now, the first thing that happens when you're out eating, the milkshake, the cheeseburger, the pizza, the first thing that occurs is things in your bloodstream get sticky, sticky, sticky. And here we have the platelets get sticky, the endothelium gets sticky, your bad LDL cholesterol gets sticky. Now here, even though I went to Yale, I've turned every now and then to Harvard, <laughs> and this happens to be Peter Libby from Harvard, and to orient you, the blood is flowing up here in the blue area. Here you see these purple cells, the endothelial cells that separate the flowing blood from the wall of the artery. Now, let's do this together. Let's go to the upper left. Here you see your orange LDL cholesterol, but it is now sticky, and it bumps up against the sticky endothelium. And if it happens to find a crack, a fissure, an opening in your endothelial cells, it now can migrate into the sub-endothelial space where, as you can see, Peter Libby from Harvard no longer paints the LDL orange, it is now yellow, because he is trying to indicate that the LDL has now been oxidized. And when you have a small, hard, dense, oxidized LDL particle, that's kind of nasty, and your subendothelial space recognizes that and calls upon the SWAT team, our white blood cells, to come across and help with this problem. And here, Peter Libby from Harvard has painted the SWAT team blue in honor of Yale, and we like that. <laughs> now, here, this macrophage is now behaving like Pac-Man gobbling up, gobbling up, gobbling up all these small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol particles until we get all the way over here to the right. When we in medicine do what we do so often, we change the name. It is now called a foam cell. A foam cell is the one that macrophage is now absolutely all filled up with those small, hard, dense LDL particles. And that is truly the Darth Vader of this sequence of events that I'm sharing with you. Why? Because the metalloproteinase happens to uh, make these, uh, the foam cell makes these nasty, nasty enzymes. Metalloproteinases like stromelicin, elastase, collagenase, and myeloperoxidase, what do they do that is so bad? What they do is they progressively erode, they erode the cap over the plaque. It gets thinner and thinner and thinner until the sheer force of blood racing over that thin cap tears it. That is the seminal moment. Once you have torn the cap over your plaque, you now have the extravasation or the oozing out of, if you will, of plaque content into the flowing blood, where it now activates our clotting factors, such as platelets. And in a matter of minutes, we now are over here to be, and here is this clot. And the clot is in and of itself 
self-propagating. So in a matter of further minutes, we're all the way over here to see. Look at this. Suddenly, within a matter of minutes, an artery that was no more than 35% blocked is now 100% blocked. No time for collaterals to develop. Suddenly, all the downstream heart muscle here is immediately deprived of oxygen and nutrients, and it starts to die, and that's your heart attack. Now, if I do my job correctly this evening, every one of you, and hopefully your friends and relatives, can make themselves heart attack proof. How are you going to do that? You're not going to do it with a pill. You're not going to do it with a drug. You're not going to do it with a stent. You're not going to do it with a bypass. You are going to make yourself heart attack proof by changing your biochemistry. How are you going to change your biochemistry? Changing your food to whole food plant-based nutrition. Once you do this, you totally interrupt this cascade of events that I just described to you. Whole food, plant-based nutrition, and things don't get sticky. Things do not migrate into the subendothelial space. You do not have the SWAT team. You do not have the formation of the foam cell. The foam cell is not there, so it can't produce any of the metalloproteinases, or it cannot thin out the cap over the plaque. Eating this way, you will strengthen the cap over the plaque. If you strengthen the cap over your plaque, it cannot rupture. If it cannot rupture, you have now made yourself heart attack proof. How exciting is that? And you can do it. And you can do it without anything that has got any hideous expense. You just got to eat. And there's no pharmaceutical injury or side effect at all. It's as if it you really have had a gift from the heavens above, the plant-based nutrition. Now, <laughs> for years this used to be a uh, cartoon in my presentation. Halfway through his hardy man breakfast, Rank felt he heard several of his small arteries slamming shut. Okay? No longer a, uh, because forget the x-ray here, but I want you to concentrate. Here we have half the artery filled with plaque. The other half is wide open. All right? And here you see these little tiny endothelial cells. This is the interesting history of the endothelial cell. Up until 1980, we used to think of the endothelial cells as nothing more than these cute little red bricks that were lining our pipes. In 1980, that all changed. Why? Because Dr. Furstadt, working in Brooklyn, was taking the largest blood vessel of the rodent, the aorta, the aorta, and then he would do this sort of elliptical spiral staircase cut all the way down, injuring the end of feeling as he did it, immersed it in saline, and it would constrict. One day, however, no cut. Took the aorta, immersed it, it dilated. Did it again, it dilated. Suddenly, the race was on globally. What was the EDRF that Dr. Furstadt had discovered? The endothelial derived relaxation factor. Rolls right off your tongue. <laughs> and thank heavens that term was with us only eight years. Because at the end of eight years, Dr. Furstadt, Dr. Nuria, and Dr. Louis Gnarl discovered that the EDRF was a gas. And that gas was nitric oxide. 
Now, what was so exciting about that discovery? Well, what are the functions of nitric oxide? One, nitric oxide keeps all those cellular elements in our bloodstream flowing smoothly, like Teflon rather than Velcro, keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. You climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, <clears throat> the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate. Nitric oxide. Number two, three. Nitric oxide protects the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, <coughs> stiff, or inflamed. Protects us from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four. Number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaque. So literally everybody on the planet who has cardiovascular disease has their disease because by now they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised and turned their endothelial system into a train wreck that they no longer have enough endothelial system in the system to protect themselves from making blockages and plaque. However, the good news, this is not a malignancy. This is a completely benign foodborne illness. And once you can get patients to agree to stop ever again having anything pass through their lips that is going to further injure an already train wreck endothelium, then the endothelium recovers, makes enough nitric oxide so we can halt, halt, stop any disease progression. And often we see elements of significant disease reversal. Pretty exciting stuff. Now, you're probably sitting out there wondering, gosh, I wonder, I wonder what my level of nitric oxide is. And I say to some people saying, I don't think Dr. Esselstyn gets it. I'm going down to the health food store. I'm going to buy a jug of pills that will make me make so much nitric oxide it'll be coming out of my ears. <laughs> Don't do that. It's been tried. It's harm harmful. Uh, you're going to get it from your food, and you're going to get it from your own endothelial cells. And we'll fill you out some more of that as we progress through this talk. All right. How do we measure? your nitric, nitric oxide. It'll be coming eventually, I'm sure, to doctor's offices, but in a research setting, you take an ultrasound probe, place it over the brachial artery at the elbow, and there in the readout, you can see the diameter of the brachial artery. Then for five minutes, you encircle the upper arm with a blood pressure cuff, inflate it above systolic blood pressure so that for five minutes, you have absolutely zero blood flow to your forearm and hand. I've had that done. It's not exactly habit forming. <laughs> then you release the cuff and immediately measure the new diameter of the brachial artery. And in the normal individual, it'll be 30% greater. Okay. Pretty exciting. The next thing that was important that occurred in this was when Dr. Robert Vogel from the University of Maryland <coughs> took a group of healthy young <coughs> subjects to a certain fast food restaurant that is characterized by arches which are golden. <coughs> half of them got the cornflakes. The other half had the hash browns and sausage. Now the group that had the cornflakes break it out of the test, no. The group that had the hash browns and sausage, within 120 minutes, 
they couldn't dilate their artery. These healthy young subjects had the meal that had so trashed, injured, and compromised the capacity of their endothelial cells to make nitric oxide, they couldn't do it. But as they followed them into the late uh, evening, they began to recover. But you and I know, <laughs> the next morning for breakfast, scrambled eggs and bacon. Lunchtime, we'll have cold cuts, mayonnaise, and <clears throat> white bread. Supper time, we'll have a baked potato with sour cream, vegetables soaked in butter, lamb chops, ranch dressing on a salad, ice cream for dessert. Here in the good old USA, starting as in our childhood, we, throughout the day, we hammer, trash, beat up, and injure our endothelial cells so that by the time we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and so forth, we start to have this epidemic of heart disease, which does not even exist in half the planet. Yeah. Okay. Now this is just, again, to orient you as to where the endothelial cell resides. And once again, I'm going to have you share with me a study from Harvard. This is a murine study, and these are litter mates of mice. Now, they got different diets. In this group up here, they had the typical lab child, and after 12 weeks, they had no evidence of any uh, atherosclerotic disease. Now, this group of litter mates uh, got the typical Western diet, and you can see in 12 weeks, they already had a significant formation of atherosclerotic. But then look down at this group. Litter mates, they had the so-called high-protein Atkins diet. This will help you if you ever get into a vigorous discussion with people who are ketogenic or paleo, what have you. Uh, and you can see within 12 weeks how profound this disease was forming. And there was no difference between this group and this group in terms of total cholesterol, no different difference between the number of small, hard LDL particles. The difference was protein alone. And what was the protein? The same one that my good friend, Dr. Colin Campbell, talks about with his tumors, casein. It was casein, the leading protein in all. Here. Now here, we're looking at, it's a little different, FMD is flow-mediated dilatation. That's the ability of the artery to dilate compared to different diets. The worst diet was the Atkins high-protein diet. The next worst was South Beach. And the champ, the champ was plant-based. Now here's the new kid. The new kid on the block is the endothelial progenitor cell. What are these? The endothelial progenitor cell arises from your bone marrow and it replaces your senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. Now, if I have somebody in front of me who happens to be obese, diabetic, hypertensive, high blood pressure, a couch potato, and I measure the endothelial progenitor cells, they're going to be low. Somebody who's just the antithesis of that will be higher. But for my patients, I absolutely, I absolutely want to see the endothelial progenitor cells slowly sparkle. How do you do that? We have to turn to a study from Okinawa. And a study in Okinawa looking at the healthiest human being on the planet, a young woman between the ages of 17 and 34. They took the group, divided it in half, 
half of the control group, the other half were ingesting five Okinawan green leafy vegetables daily. When they finished the study and they measured the endothelial progenitor cells, they were strikingly higher in the women who were eating the five servings of green leafy vegetables. And you're going to see when it comes to tr treatment how exciting that's going to be. <laughs> Here it is, in case you doubt me. This is the, uh, the study from Okinawa. Now, there's been a lot of talk about HDL cholesterol. HDL cholesterol, throughout the 80s and 90s, HDL cholesterol was supposed to be important because if you had a lot of HDL cholesterol, people said you were protected from having a heart attack. Well, the wheels began to come off that a little bit. One. What happened is, when we started our first small study in 1985, we noticed that the men, immediately, within a month or two, their HDL cholesterol was not only falling, it was falling lower than the accepted low limit of normal for males in America, which is 40 milligrams per deciliter. Here these guys were, in this first study, they were seriously ill with heart disease. I was giving them this wonderful plant-based diet and their HDL was dropping. But at the same time, they were losing weight, their symptoms were disappearing, and when we carefully studied them, they were reversing their disease. What's going on here? In 2006, the drug company Pfizer was going to make the pill that was going to end all heart disease. Half of the pill was Lipitor, which would drop your bad LDL cholesterol. The other half was Torcetrabib, which would drive your HDL cholesterol up through the roof over 100. It went through the phase one trials, fine. Phase two trial, fine came to the phase three trial. Just before the chairman of Pfizer was about to bring this on the public, he got a call from the chairman of the Independent Monitoring Committee. Mr. Pfizer, chairman, sir, we have a problem. Okay, what's that? Well, in the control group, there had been 51 deaths. However, in the touricentric group, there were 81 deaths. So it was killing people. So fortunately, that didn't come out. Now, all along the way, in January of 2011, Dan Rader and his team of lipid chemists from the University of Pennsylvania reporting in the January 13th issue of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, did the following. They drew blood from 2,000 patients and measured their HDL cholesterol level. Some were high, some were medium, some were low. Then they did a fascinating thing. They took each of those cholesterols and they measured the ability, the capacity of the cholesterol to do its job. Guess what they found? There was no relationship whatsoever between the measured blood level of HDL cholesterol and its ability to do its job. You could have a high level that was almost meaningless, and you could have a low level of HDL that was an absolute powerhouse. Pretty exciting stuff. So it was the very next, it was the very next month. February of 2011, in Nature Review of Cardiology, the, U, the uh, researchers from UCLA uh, began to look at the protein portion, the protein portion of the HDL 
HDL molecule, the ApoA1, the protein moiety is the word we use. And what they found was that when you eat the typical Western diet, you oxidize and you injure that ApoA1 portion of the HDL molecule and you turn that HDL molecule from an anti-inflammatory molecule trying to help you to a pro-inflammatory molecule that join, joining with your LDL to injure you. Pretty exciting stuff. Now, I know you've all been waiting for this one. <laughs> so let's break it down and make some sense out of it. Okay. Here is arginine. We'll look at the left first. This is a semi-essential amino acid. And it's kind of important in the food that we eat because it goes up here and is converted by nitric oxide synthase, which is an enzyme in your endothelial cell that is responsible for making whoopee, nitric oxide, which is what we want. Now let's go to the other side. Here we have ADMA, asymmetric dimethyl arginine. Now this is a byproduct of normal metabolism, and we don't want too much of this, because look here, it, too much of it will muck up and injure the capacity of nitric oxide synthase to make nitric oxide. So where we really see this in stages if you look at people who have kidney failure, who are on dialysis, because the, norm, the way we normally get rid of ADMA is through the urine, and it can get metabolized away by the enzyme DDAH, dimethylarginine, dimethylaminohydrolase. Now, so a patient who cannot make urine cannot get rid of this. And therefore, it mucks up this, and those poor souls have a very low level of nitric oxide. However, what about the rest of us who may have your normal urinary function, normal kidney function? Is there anything that we do that mucks up and injures the ability of DDAH to get rid of this? Yes. What? High cholesterol injures DDAH. High homocysteine injures DDAH. High triglycerides will injure DDAH. So will insulin resistance and diabetes and smoking. But guess what? Absolutely every single one of those that I've just mentioned except smoking can be resolved with whole food, plant-based nutrition. Aha, uh -huh. we come to the chapter five in my book, Moderation Kills. Now, uh, it's probably gonna be important to say a word about this. <clears throat> If you think about it, when I first see a patient with heart disease, at that moment, their endothelial system, their endothelial system is so beaten down that not only are they not making nitric oxide, but the problem is, when we finally get them to do this correctly, let's just say a normal level of endothelial function of nitric oxide is here. When you have a heart attack, it's down here. I really work with them, get them to understand this. They bring it up to here. Now, they no longer are making <laughs> it so bad that they're gonna have any heart. Matter of fact, they're gonna start to reverse their disease. But the thing that is critical is that they cannot deviate from that because you never get back up to what you were as a kid. 
but you're up here enough to protect yourself from heart disease, and then if they decide to drift and, and get away from 100%, then bingo, we're back down here again. Not a good plan. So the question is this, how are we gonna get patients to understand the importance of doing this correctly? And the exciting thing is, how do you how do you get into somebody's head to do this? And that's why I'm so fussy about the two words we learned tonight: the endothelial cells and nitric oxide. So, if anybody here in this audience has heart disease or knows of anybody with heart disease, they should know now it's because they have so trashed, injured their endothelial capacity to make nitric oxide, they can't do it. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna have a little fun with these patients. Once they understand this, if they say to me, uh, or no, I usually ask them, how often do we eat out? Oh, Dr. Esselstyn, <laughs> nearly not very often. So well, let me let me try that again. How often do you eat out? Thirty-two, three times a week. All right, three times a week. That's 156 days out of 365. That right? You're still trashing your endothelial cells. You're going to get your second heart attack. Don't want that. And maybe they say, well, you know, I, Dr. Esselstyn, you don't understand. Uh, when I go to a restaurant, I tell them to take it easy on the oil. What does that mean? <laughs> take it easy on the oil. No, when you go to a restaurant, if you first it's nice to eat at home, but if you have to go to a restaurant, you can. But if you're going to go to a restaurant, you look the waiter or the waitress in the eye, and you tell them, understand this, I am deathly allergic to a single drop of any oil. So, she, she or he works with you, they look over the menu, and lo and behold, doesn't seem to be much there. Everything seems to have oil. So then you discreetly say, What's, I'd like to just see the, I'd like to see the chef for a moment. The chef comes out, they are just so flattered. You just tell them, square it away. Deathly allergic to a drop of oil. Can't have animal protein, dairy, or sugar. Fine, I'll be back in 23 minutes with your order. Comes back, wonderful, beans and rice, maybe potatoes with some vegetables. But look, there are four reasons to go out to eat at a restaurant, right? One, you don't have to do the cooking. Two, you don't have to do the dishes. Three, the ambiance for the companionship, but you never, ever go out to eat to further destroy your endothelial system, okay? <laughs> now, it gets a little dicey when you go to somebody's house, and if they're having a buffet, not a problem. You eat, you eat before you go, or you eat when you get home, but you go through the buffet, put on all that terrible food, play with it, move it around, not a problem. <laughs> However, now it gets dicey. Now it gets dicey because your old friend, Bill and Ruth, are having you over to a small sit-down. There's gonna be one other couple, you're sitting down, and this is when you have to really work your interpersonal skills. <laughs> uh, Ruth, uh, you know, Harriet and I are so proud and delighted to be invited to your house. But you have to know this. Right now, I am being cared for by this monster from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> okay. Probably 
probably on Wednesday. I'm going to show you a couple of rather colossal, striking, exciting examples of disease reversal without statins. How many statin drugs did they take in Okinawa, rural China, Central Africa, the Tara Himara, maybe the Papua Highlanders? I don't think they take any. Now, <clears throat> the statins have been around for 20 years. 20 years ago, what was the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization? Cardiovascular disease. Now, 20 years later, 20 years of status, the leading killer, cardiovascular disease. So there's not any argument that in people who are going to continue to eat the terrible Western diet, those patients will do a little better on statins. However, the statins do have some problems. There are some side effects. Sometimes patients get enough neuromuscular pain from taking a statin, they can't get up off the floor, or if they're so miserable with it, they just throw them down the toilet. Or you can get a liver injury from statins. Or uh, you can get diabetes from statins. Or you can get brain fog from statins. I'm not going to get in a wrestling match with any of you or your physician who wants to have you on a statin because if they're watching for these and it's careful and you're not, you're not eating plant-based and you want to have a statin because it makes your numbers look better, that's fine. But if I, if I had, if I could be king for a day and could make everybody be plant-based, we wouldn't have a need for that. Okay. Uh, this is just data to show you that, no question, that when you took over the, the way pay, people respond, many of them will simply give up taking their stat. Okay. <laughs> now we come to fish oil. The problem with fish oil is there's a certain number who will get PCDs, dioxin, mercury, and how does the fish get its omega-3? This is why you're doing that. You're taking these to get omega-3. Why do you have to take fish oil? Where does the fish get its omega-3? From algae. So if we have patients who want to take a pill to get their algae higher, we would suggest omega-3 algae. Omega-3 algae does not have fish oil. Now, I think it's probably important to if you don't know where it is, maybe once get your omega-3 check. Usually people who are eating a certain amount of flaxseed meal or chia seeds or plenty of green leafy vegetables, uh, omega-3 shouldn't be a problem, but there may be some who slip through the cracks. Maybe a one-time test of omega-3 check. An omega check will tell you whether you're optimal, borderline, or poor. And if you're borderline or poor, then I would think you'd want to consider taking the omega-3 algae. Okay. Now here is a study of 20,000 patients uh, proving that fish oil does not, not seem to help heart disease. And now the question comes up about aspirin. And a lot of people automatically when they have heart disease will go on aspirin. Their doctors asked them to. And I have no problem with that for maybe a year or two. But if after a year or two we have our patients who are totally plant-based with the blood tends to be thinner, then I think at that point the potential risk for aspirin uh, can be in the balance of things. You could make an argument at that point to get off the aspirin. What's, what are the side effects of aspirin? You can have a cerebral hemorrhage, a bleed into the brain, not good. Not good at all. Also with aspirin, you can have gastrointestinal hemorrhage, not good. And also, you can have a problem with macular degeneration, which is kind of blindness. This is a small percentage, but it is significant. Interesting. 
this is a beta blocker, something like a topamol, which you've all heard about probably. And the beta blocker is now being questioned by Dr. Bangalore, who questions the use of it after a heart attack or a known heart disease without a heart attack or with coronary artery disease risk factors only. He feels Without congestive heart failure, the evidence for prevention of long-term clinical outcomes is non-existent. Now we come to stents and bypasses. Now there's no question that a stent or a bypass for somebody who's in the middle of having a heart attack can be absolutely life-saving. However, once these patients are stable, elective, not an emergency, with stents and bypass that does not appear, does not appear to be any prolongation of life or any protection from a future heart attack, which really challenges these procedures and gets a lot of people upset. But for patients who are willing to make the transition to whole food plant-based nutrition, I think they can save themselves the trauma of those procedures. <coughs> Inside the artery, 
you then have to put these patients on an anticoagulant for at least, for roughly, a year because your blood does not like to run over bare wire without clotting. And therefore, for at least a year, as you were taking that anticoagulant to keep your stent from clotting, at the same time, new, brand new endothelial cells are finding their way to grow over that stent. Now this is a bit of interesting history, and I'm gonna probably stop with this slide tonight after I tell you about it, and we'll have some time for questions, because on Wednesday, Wednesday I'm gonna share with you two uh, studies that I got involved in with patients with heart disease to see if we couldn't arrest and reverse the heart disease. And <clears throat> the man that you're looking at here on your right is Mason Soames. And Mason Soames, in 1958, he was the chairman of the Cleveland Clinic Catheterization Laboratory. And in 1958, the only reason that the catheterization existed was to put the catheter into the heart ventricle and look at the valve. That was the only surgery they were doing in 1958 for the heart, was this sort of valve surgery. And on one particular day, he was watching the image amplifier while his assistant had run the catheter up into the heart. And Mason said, okay. So the plunger went down. An enormous amount of dye went into the heart, but it didn't go into the ventricle. It went where you, you were never supposed to put dye because it was said to be fatal. It was put into the coronary artery. And he was, and the nation saw this happening. He immediately looked at the heart monitor and it was going, boom, in flat line. He yelled at the patient, cough. The patient coughed, came back. But Mason was absolutely brilliant. He said, look, if we can dilute the dye and use much, much less of it, we can map out the disease in the coronary arteries. And so that happened. And physicians would flock all over the world to come to Cleveland to see Mason Soames do this technique. And it was uh, sponsored really throughout the world. Everybody began to do this. But it was kind of crazy because here you got people flocking to see all the disease in their arteries, but we had no pills, no drugs, no surgery, nothing for it, until I continue to the other half of the story. This other gentleman that you see here, he was a wonderful general surgeon from Argentina, and he left his 10-year practice in Argentina to come to the clinic to learn at the Cleveland Clinic cardiothoracic surgery. 1963, that was the year that I was taking a rotation through cardiothoracic surgery, and I worked with this wonderful fellow, Rene. He had a great pair of hands. He had all the milk of human kindness. He was a, a gentle, caring, creative physician. After three months, I left to finish my rotation. He stayed the whole two years, finished his cardiothoracic training, went back to Argentina, and they said, oh, big deal. So he went to Cleveland and got some training. What are we supposed to do about it? He didn't think that was very welcoming. So they loved him in Cleveland, so he was brought on to the full staff at the Cleveland Clinic. And in 1967, when I was in Vietnam, Rene Favaloro was operating at the Cleveland Clinic on a patient's heart that began to suddenly go blue. And he said to the team, cut the leg. They cut the leg, harvested the vein, and made a jump bypass right by the blockage and the heart pink up again. Coronary artery surgery was born. Rene Favaloro was the absolute father of this 
procedure, and he was recognized throughout the world because what happened was Mason Soames so loved Favaloro that he just fed him case after case after case, and Favaloro wrote the monograph on this. He wrote numerous papers and a book. All over the world, he would go and visit and travel. He was conversant in English, French, Spanish, and Italian. It was so flattering that wherever he went, he could probably find a language that was common. And when I got back from Vietnam and was asked to join the staff of the Cleveland Clinic in general surgery, at this point, they had previously had one surgeon for one locker in the locker room. But now they were getting overloaded with surgeons and they doubled them up. And they doubled them up in the locker by the alphabet. And Esselstyn was next to Favaloro. So Rene and I once again shared the same locker until after 1971. By this time, the chorus of voices from Argentina pleading with Favaloro to come back, he finally succumbed and finished his career in, in Argentina. And that's as far as I really wanted to take it with you tonight. Uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, try to uh, take some questions if, if we have a moment. And I just want to leave you with uh, what I think is so exciting about Wednesday. Because uh, the reason that I find myself at 19 years after having retired from surgery, more passionate than ever about what can be the seismic revolution in health, not only in this country, but really throughout the Western civilization. We now have at our fingertips something that is so ridiculously simple and straightforward and safe and inexpensive, we can wipe out chronic illness. And that the job is to try to get patients to understand it. How do we get patients to change their lifestyle? How do we get them to understand the nutritional literacy that will empower them to absolutely annihilate chronic illness? Dr. 
I don't want to ask you a question. I want to thank you in front of all these people. Your book saved my life. I was a cardiac cripple like you had in your book. I couldn't walk down the stairs here. And in 19, didn't come half easily. In 1985, I had five bypass surgery. I've had three stints. And uh, today, when we went to, and I followed your diet without cheating at all.
the rest of our hearts at this beautifully coordinated love dub, love dub, that lovely coordinated rhythm. What seems to happen in atrial fibrillation is that other smaller, little spark plugs will develop and interrupt so that after your sinoauricular node fires off, blub dub dub blub dub dub it's, it's inefficient and therefore what they the skillful operator will pass a catheter with a radio frequency capability identifying where those other little spark plugs are and they get hit with a radio frequency current and that eliminates them and it's so nice then you can go back to normal sinus rhythm because i'm particularly what I don't like about fibrillation, which is the fact that people have to have a, a blood thinner. And I don't like that because blood thinners to me, if you slip on a carpet at home, or if you fall going down the stairs, or if you're riding your bike and you fall, even with a helmet, you fall and hit your head when you're on a blood thinner, that's not gonna be good. So I would encourage you to, to see find you had some ablation. Sometimes they don't work the first time, but you might find somebody who has a great reputation. If you want to talk to me, I can perhaps give you a name or two. Over here. Thank you, Dr. Essis. And I was curious, are you ever, ever invited to cardiology seminars and do they allow you to speak and how? what the acceptance is. Last year I had a chance for my second time to speak at Harvard. The first time I asked the Mass General, another time at the, uh, at the Brigham. And there have been about 19 academic institutions that have uh, <laughs> put their toe in the water and have had a chance to uh, share my work there. But, uh, it's really, to me, so disappointing that more physicians don't jump on this. And I'll tell you a number of reasons why I think that happens. Right now, we have got a system where physicians are handsomely compensated for a stent or a bypass. Okay. But if you talk about Brussels sprouts and broccoli, <laughs> It's a little, little different. Also, four years ago, I was invited by the American College of Cardiology. They wanted me to be a member of their nutrition committee, which I have done. And one of our jobs is to try to see if we can't get cardiologists educated about the causation of the illness. Because with all due respect, and we did, we did a study where we uh, with questionnaires, we asked cardiologists how much nutrition training they had received, either in medical school or in their postgraduate cardiology training. It's practically zero. So here they are, floundering because they have no information or no knowledge or no education about the causation of the illness that they've been asked to treat. So it's really hard for them to be up on something you're you're always down on something you're not up on. And so I think that it's going to take a while. But I think that the science uh, will prevail. I mean, it's so safe and it's so easy uh, and it's so powerfully enduring. Thank you. Doctor, does uh, someone who otherwise is in good health but has a leaking heart valve, I don't know which valve, uh, would they benefit it would be unfair of me to tell you that we have done studies with nutrition on, and, and the effect on valves. Uh, if it's an aortic valve and, the, uh, and it's, there's an aortic stenosis, which is a narrowing of the valve that often comes with people as they get more senior. Um, I think that I would be a great fan to have that valve replaced, not surgically, because I think now 
the expertise is there in a number of institutions where if you have an aortic valve stenosis, that with a catheter approach, they can act safely and effectively replace that graft or that valve just as effectively as surgery. So that's it's really quite exciting. Now, my... Uh, we have time for one more question? Okay. Just one. Well, my father always used to say, be sure you read while you're most welcome. <laughs> um, where did I see that hand over? Right. Yeah. I, I appreciate you being here so much. It's really a lot to be in my belt. Uh, I have a question for my brother who has had several stints and his, uh, he's been on plant based about that for three years. His cholesterol is 188, his HDL is 35, and his uh, LDL is 110. But his doctor wants his LDL to be below 70. And he wants to put him on statins, and he doesn't want to do that. So, what would you suggest? Well, I would—I don't think it's—it's it's good to get into a wrestling match uh, with their with their physician. Uh, but if did you say he had been a hundred percent whole food plant based nutrition? Mark, yes, and it's learning. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Remember that I said tonight that there were two words that I wish that you could remember. And those two words were the endothelial cells and nitric oxide. Now, if suddenly something were to happen and he was completely depri uh, deprived of any statin drugs, which I gather he's not taking, and if he was to be uh, totally whole food, plant-based nutrition. Uh, what happens to your endothelial cells? You regain your endothelial fortress. You regain your endothelial fortress, meaning that with so much nitric oxide, there's no crack, there's no fissure, there's no opening in this endothelium. And your cholesterol simply becomes sort of an innocent bystander flowing by your powerful endothelium. But you have a situation with the doctor, and one, yeah, I think a reasonable approach would be to say to the doctor, look, I'm not keen about this drug. I hear there's so many side effects. How about if I just take the most modest dose that you and I can work on, see how that works, and also, uh, I think that way, keeping tabs on it, nobody gets terribly upset. At the same time, you're trying to move toward the goal that you're gonna have, because as I'll show you tomorrow, uh, some of our most profound results came with patients who simply could not take statins. Because every month at the Cleveland Clinic, at the Wellness Institute, I conduct uh, at the, uh, where I, direct the cardiovascular disease prevention and reversal program. I conduct this six hour seminar. And we have many patients who sign up to see us who simply couldn't take a stand because of the side effects. Guess what? They were in no way precluded from enjoying the same kind of beneficial results. And I'm gonna show you that on Wednesday. Good night.